Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with a very special guest, Dr. Jordan Wishy. Jordan, welcome to The Jewish View. Thank you, Rabbi Simon. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're writing a new book, and therefore we like to always have books. The Jewish people are the, the people of the book, and you're writing a new book called Start Over Nation. And uh, first of all, so tell us, uh, give us a summary. It's not even publicized, so we're giving our uh, viewers a first-hand look that nobody else has. Sure, I'm happy to do so. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm trying to drive a paradigm shift in the way people are looking at what they're doing in the world and the way people understand Torah and God. And uh, that paradigm shift is one toward creativity, that we're creative people, God is the creator, and he created us in his image and he wants us to emulate him and uh, in the most important aspect to be creative and uh, too often people think religion is stymieing you know people and all these rules and regulations but really the possibility exists that religion can be a great creative force for humanity and indeed when I look at history I think that it has and I think that the Jewish nation in particular has played a decisive role in promoting a particular system of creativity in particular what I found when I looked at the Jewish framework in the Torah is that, uh, and, and this is not in contrast to the accepted or the received or the traditional wisdom, uh, that being that the Torah creates a monotheistic framework and focuses on morality, uh, a divine-driven morality that uh, isn't subject to reason, which is subject to error, uh, but in addition to the monotheism and the morality that the nation of Israel spreads to the world, that we also play a particular anchoring role in the global cultural system specifically that because God commanded the Jewish nation or the Israelite nation to dwell alone, that the Israelite nation doggedly or persistently maintains its cultural boundaries so well um, that it sort of anchors the global order culturally in diversity and decentralization so that we never get absorbed in other um, you know, other, other nations. Well, you're saying so many things already, so many <laughs> questions ready in, in your first opening statements. But I, it's interesting because I know the history books is what is Judaism given to the world? And they'll say, well, monotheism. But that's just religion. And you're right that um, I think religion has been given a bad name, so to speak, maybe, because, you know, it says religious, all right, go to the temple or go to the church wherever, you know, your one hour, go to your festive uh, holidays a few days a year. And it really has nothing to do with the personal person. And here you're right. I mean, it's, it's a rabbi, but it's really very Judaic what you're saying. And other religions don't have such an idea, really. They're more existentialist, like it is God wants, it is what it is. And, you know, and I have to even tell people, forget it is what it is. You know, mm -hmm. a right God made it. You're right, creative or be proactive maybe is a good word also. You know, pray for change, make change, not just it is what it is, what can you do? Sure, and we see in the Bible that God created these 70 nations and wanted these 70 nations to be creative you know, forces in the world. Uh, but right after the 70 nations get established, we see that uh, the rise of imperialism and the rise of empire um, under the you know, leadership of Nimrod. Um, and he's just an archetype or a prototype of the kind of leaders that want to destroy the diversity that supports the creativity. Uh, and so Avraham Avinu at that time, uh, Abraham our father, refused to um, participate in the building of the Tower of Babylon with all the bricks. And the bricks represent the loss of diversity because of uh, the bricks are all the same. Uh, so that this diversity is what's necessary for creativity. And I'm trying to get people to, you know, sort of like refocus who we are as a people on the creativity. Well, you know, it's very interesting. It's again what I was saying about, you know, Judah and people pigeonhole Judaism as a religion. And there's so much to offer if you have to look a little deeper, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you should look be deeper mm -hmm. and you find a little, it really is political science. This reminds me of the American Revolution where they wanted, they were revolutionaries, obviously, mm -hmm. and they just, they also wanted to be, for example, like you say, creative and open-minded, and it seems like they were fighting an uphill battle where even there's always some rulers or ruling class that's saying, well, we're in charge now, and they want to stifle this freedom, or as maybe you put it, the creativity, to do things a little bit different. 
Right, and I think the founders were very focused on creativity and were very connected to that that you know view of the Bible that they got from reading you know the new, the old and the New Testament, um, this kind of view of you know people as creative beings. And when they designed the American political system, they created decentralization, uh, meaning that we have state governments that are sovereign, right, along with the national government. So it's this kind of uh, dual sovereignty, and the national government has its sphere of authority, and then the, anything that's not specifically assigned as a power in the U.S. Constitution to the national government is a residual power of the state governments, and then that may devolve to the local governments, so that um, from the bottom up there are many, many units of government that are sort of like vehicles for people to express themselves. Uh, and if you want to, in Del Mar, do something a little differently than what we're doing in Albany uh, with taxes or garbage pickup or, you know, any kind of, it could be from the momentous to the mundane, people can do things differently. And oftentimes um, creating something new or coming up with uh, a change or, or an innovation is just looking to recalibrate our mind uh, ever so slightly, ever so slightly. So yeah, I think the founders, uh, founders of the United States were tuned into that, exactly, yeah. It's interesting there, you were talking about Tower, Tower of Babel, but it really, again, link it back for our audience, really back to the uh, basic story. So it sounds like, and it hurts me a lot that we're children, of course, learned this in Hebrew school, the Tower of Babel story, again, just for our viewers, if they haven't heard about it, that all the people wanted to build the tower to God. So they were very unified, so that was a very nice idea. It's nice to have the world people on one page, which is not so often to say the very, very least. But on the other hand, they were unified for a bad reason, like rebellion, but you're taking a, a new take on it just to be monothelistic monothol that they're just all the same. And that's not, it's interesting the way you put it because Again, I'm my my mind is constantly thinking. You open up my mind to a lot of different ideas. And I hope you do for our viewers. Is just that um, some we're not just all the same. We're not robotics. You know, a lot of I think governments or in, you know citizens a little bit in America too. We're all the same, and that wasn't the beauty of America. Yes, we're all Americans, and we don't rebel against the government. We're good Americans, but we could be Jewish or we could be black and Puerto Rican and white and. Wasp, and we could all work together. That's the beauty of it, being different but working together. But the Tower of Babel was something totally different, just be totally the same. Totally the same. The Nassif talks about this, um, that the tower is a totalitarian watchtower, not only to keep people in, but also to make sure that um, they didn't want anybody to leave because they were concerned that, uh, let's say you and I left, we could form our own new political community, and eventually we'll have some people with us, and then we can challenge the, the original regime. So they didn't want to let anybody out. So they were really you know trying to build this watchtower to make sure that people wouldn't be able to get out. And the Nitsev's feeling is that this was completely um, inappropriate because while, as the Nitsev understood it, and this is, I think, Rabbi Tzvidi Yehuda Berlin, is that correct, Rabbi Simon? Correct. Right. Uh, a great Talmudist uh, about from 100 years ago. About 100 yeah. years ago. Um, and so that he described that while the Jewish people have a revelation, uh, and therefore that's coming directly from the divine and is correct, that since the rest of the world didn't have such a direct divine revelation, um, no man should be able to establish a vision, political or social or otherwise, that would trump everybody else's vision and um, you know stamp out independent thought. Um, that that just wasn't what God intended for humanity. It's a very interesting. It's just it's really beautiful because you have, for example, you know that we learn the Torah and you learn the law. So you say, well, this is the law. Well, it's not so simple. And if you op anybody opens up the Talmud, they're always arguing. It's not just this is the law given from God. On one hand, you do say this is the law given from God, but all you see is diversity, just mm -hmm. constant argument. You say yes, they say no. I mean, not just for the sake of argument, but just because they had different views. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not nice just to say you say yes. Whatever you say, I'll say the opposite. That's not correct behavior. Right. But listen, I can have my viewpoint, and you can have your viewpoint, mm -hmm. and we can have a friendly debate, mm -hmm. and we can also come to a right conclusion. But that idea of diversity is really a part of Torah. It's interesting because it's a contradiction. It's a paradox. You say well, there's one Torah, one God, but uh, there's so many different people in the world. You would think unity is a, it's just a defined unity, being that we can all be different, but we can all work together as a unit, not just be, again, like robotic, like stamps out of the a car. They're all the same, you know, out of the 
a factory we're all the same because we aren't we're all different right and I would say that there like you mentioned that there are many different uh, and varying viewpoints in the Jewish world and the Talmud and subsequent commentators disagree with one another quite a lot and um, sometimes uh, God has given us a clear directive on a particular thing but very often uh, it would seem to me at least that um, he hasn't outlined the entire program and um, he's invited uh, the scholars the you know wise people of each generation uh, to participate with him and this is the creative process in a Establishing the halacha, and it's not that any particular person has a monopoly on a way to view God's will for people in this world, but rather that by you know interacting in a collect in a in a in a, in a space. Um, and, um, you know, in doing so according to a process that uh, something results and that this creative process itself is what God desires. It develops the person. You know, Jordan, maybe we talked about that you're a doctor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, because I know you're into political science, so maybe that's why it dovetails into everything we're talking about, our babble. Oh, it does. So, Rabbi Simon, thank you for asking that question. I, you know, got my doctorate in political science here in the Capital District at the University at Albany uh, and did a lot of work in public administration and policy for, you know, a bunch of years. But uh, I always felt that I couldn't integrate my Torah life and my uh, academic political science life. And uh, then I moved to Israel, and then uh, it seemed in this book, I got the when the ideas for this book came to my mind. It seemed as though these two traditions uh, or knowledge domains that I was uh, looking to bridge together, uh, that I was able to do so, and have come together in this in this book. And I see, for example, we talked about the political decentralization. Uh, I'm claiming that uh, the Jewish people are promoting political decentralization. We only want a small nation state. We don't want a huge empire where we control the whole world. That's never been a goal of the Jewish people. We've always respected the political and cultural integrity of other nations. Um, and uh, that my wisdom here in the United States was that we shouldn't have you know, a global empire. The United States was not an empire, it was a federalist system, and that Woodrow Wilson uh, and subsequent, uh, you know, presidents participated in the dismantling of empires. Woodrow Wilson and his, you know, 14 points of light and uh, the idea of national self-determination, which of course predates Woodrow Wilson, but that he significantly promoted um, during the World War I period in order to, you know, really uh, you know, stimulate the process of uh, dismantling European empires. Uh, so for me, the book does bring together these two different uh, knowledge domains. Um, well, in Israel, it's known that there's so many political parties. You talk about mm -hmm. diversity. There's more diverse than in Israel. You are involved in any of the political situations in Israel or... You're just learning in the in the Torah institutions. Yeah, I'm not interested in Israeli politics. I'm uh, legally Israeli, but I'm not culturally Israeli. And um, you know, there's um, I'm not really sure what to say about politics over there. It's a whole longer discussion, yeah. perhaps. Uh, but um, it's very different than politics here, and um, it doesn't please me. And uh, but where are you learning? You are oh, learning, and, and so um, so I'm writing this Israel. book at uh, Yeshiva Shavut Yisrael, which is under the uh, leadership of Rabbi Yonatan Rosenzweig, which uh, is located in Efrat, uh, in uh, outside of Jerusalem, a little bit outside of Jerusalem, uh, and uh, you know it's a you know it's a you know nice institution with uh, you know many adults uh, studying uh, you know Torah on a you know daily That's basis. That's very interesting, of course. Just uh, explain to our viewers that usually you say stu young students or, mm -hmm. or in the young 20s or master's degrees but you know a little bit older like you say adults mm -hmm. why are they learning I mean they continue learning and something only like you say young people or right. sitting in school Right. No, people, you know, from all, uh, you know, of all ages come into the Medrash, the study hall on a regular basis and are seeking, you know, an opportunity to study and to enhance their, you know, uh, understanding of Judaism and uh, knowledge of Jewish law and, uh, you know, have conversations on all sorts of questions, uh, both, uh, you know, academic and, uh, you know, and practical um, from the momentous to the mundane, um, you know, and uh, what's really interesting to me about the land of Israel relative to, um, you know, here is that the scholars, um, there's, a, there's a progressive bent to them where they're really looking to see if uh, where we can update halacha and, um, you know, where, uh, even if, if we don't have the institutions, okay, so we can't update the halacha so clearly in those cases, but uh, where can we do that? And uh, there's just more of an orientation. I think there's a liberation that maybe comes from uh, living in the land that uh, empowers people to want to think about change in, in, in uh, this change kind of Change in which way? I mean, you say liberalized halacha for our viewers means Jewish law. And 
deal with electricity, I mean, modern day. Could be electricity, I mean, but there are really computers. interesting questions. For example, like um, the uh, the Jewish sages of old believed in spontaneous generation of life. Um, there is no support for spontaneous generation of life at present. Um, you know, therefore, all, almost uh, entirely, modern thinkers do not accept any kind of spontaneous generation of life. Yet some uh, halachas uh, pertaining to, say, uh, the observance of the Sabbath um, ruled on the basis of uh, spontaneous generation of life, that this was a real thing. And so the question becomes, should we change the law now that we know spontaneous generation of life is not, um, you know, is not a real thing? Sorry, it's interesting. All right, so, so the, a yeah. little bit about yourself over what you're learning. Again, just to say that Torah is uh, people just religion and the laws and do this, this is kosher, not kosher, but you can um, develop your mind in so many, I think in every sphere really, if you look at it. Sure, and one of the, uh, you know, I'm focusing more at the sort of international cultural system in the book, but I do of course bring it back to within the nation of Israel. And you know, that God not only wants to use the nation of Israel as sort of the anchor of this global diversity, global cultural diversity, but also that God gave the Jewish people a system to use within their own community uh, to promote uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, and oftentimes creativity is uh, only requires looking at the same thing in a slightly different way. But the capacity to think outside the box, to move uh, your, or to refocus your attention from the uh, five or six features that you currently uh, ascribe to that object or that situation into a different set of, um, you know, cognitive frames, uh, it, you know, it, it's, you know, you need to be, you need to have a structure for doing that. So the laws of the Sabbath, for example, um, oftentimes you can achieve the same outcome. Uh, in the, using the laws of the Sabbath, I can cut a tomato during the week and on the Sabbath, but on the Sabbath, I might cut the tomato a little bit differently because of the laws of the Sabbath. So because I'm looking at the tomato in a different way, I'm actually creating the neurological pathways for thinking outside the box. Because once a week, 52 weeks a year, plus the holidays, uh, I'm creating the neural machinery or the neural mechanisms of mind to um, look at the same kind of situations in a totally different way. That's very interesting. You gave me a lot of food for thought. I never thought of it in that way. This that gets people away from thinking about religion as rules and regulations, and therefore it's suppressing or oppressing me. You know, I've got a straitjacket with all these rules. I can't do things. It's all about avoiding error and um, you know, and not you know, getting it wrong. And and now it's like a focus, refocusing it on creativity and building the structures of mind that enable that. No, I think it's very interesting you say that because a lot of people turn people off. They don't want to be straightjacketed. Exactly. Do this, don't do that. I mean, surely not the American framework like we're saying of freedom. Hey, I could do what I want. Right. But if you give someone a deeper idea, there's meaning to what they're doing, not just going through some rituals, old-fashioned rituals. Sure. Then that motivates them a lot. I think it's, you're, you're on the right track for that. But I never thought of that about the Sabbaths as being in a way changing your mind, changing your life, and says same old, same old, right. every day, every day you do something. So in, within our community, some people just avoid doing things because they don't want to break the law, but I think this is actually the incorrect approach because they don't give their brain a chance to do some this sort of the same to achieve the same outcome, but to do it in a slightly different way, which is exactly what the, the workaround solution is actually from this way of looking at it, what God wants. Because the workaround solution is you being creative. No, it's, it's excellent over here. You know, it's interesting. The Jewish people have a general, uh, even without the Torah, Jews are very creative. I know in Israel they are, and they're Nobel Prize winners. Because, again, you have to think out of the box just to get an A on the test. doesn't get you a Nobel Prize. Sure. You have to be, obviously, original and, like you're saying, creative. But I think that's really, um, but where does it come from? I always say that Jewish people, even if they're not religious, their genealogy, you can say their genes or the way they were brought up, just lends them to, to ideas. Maybe you have a scientist say, well, I'm not religious at all, and I don't keep this habit, but just it's really his father, his grandfather, his mm -hmm. great-grandfather knew something like that, and he's grown up with that, and something's twicking in his mind that... Uh, that something is something special is happening, right? And that maybe his his forebearers were they were creative, and because they were creative, they were more successful socially, and they were therefore able to reproduce more successfully, and so therefore those creative people were more reproductively successful, and that and therefore they trained him, and that's why he's also pretty creative. Yes, uh, very very interesting. Do you have any other examples from the Bible? I mean, you talk about the Tower of Babel. We talked about the Sabbath. 
about the idea that the Tower of Babel, again, just that all humanity is not the same. I mean, they wanted to make it the same. But I once had actually uh, another professor, and he wanted to say that, um, I don't know his name, but he actually worked on a very major senatorial campaign, mm -hmm. and he learned from the Bible how to, from Jethro, to divide up, uh, you know, blocks, 10 people, mm -hmm. like to be a judge of 10, mm -hmm. 20, 50, 100, thousands. And he set up his campaign that way, and they won the election. Oh, but it's the same mm -hmm. idea, like, saying uh, Tower of Babel, again, I just can't reiterate enough, because I try to tell people that it's a living Torah. Mm -hmm. You know, again, Hebrew school, yeah, it was a cute story, and you know, Aesop's fables, you learn all these kind of fairy tales when you're young. Obviously, you're not thinking about them when you're in college. Mm -hmm. You know, it was cute when I was, yeah, 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 when I was five years old, they read me some fairy tales. But that's what they think, unfortunately, of the Torah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was cute little Jewish stories, mm -hmm. but hey, I'm sophisticated. I have a college degree. What's that little children's story going to teach me? Right. It's a great story about the politics of the Bible. Many people, when they think about the Bible, they don't think about politics. Uh, I mean, it's right in the Bible. It seems like a lot of the Bible is about politics to me, but many people think it's morality um, and other, I mean, it's also these other things, but it's definitely also a lot well, about politics. You have politics. Pharaoh, the same idea, the, you know, Moses going to Pharaoh, mm -hmm. you're a dictator, you're, you, uh, you enslave these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can without putting the Egyptians or the Jewish people, just the idea behind it, like having a dictator enslaving people and saying, let us alone, you know, mm -hmm. let us uh, do what we want to do. Well, you, you mentioned Pharaoh, and I think it's interesting that in the text of the Torah of the five books right. of Moses, uh, only, right, uh, correct me if I'm not uh, accurate about this, but I understand that in only two places in the five books of Moses uh, is the word, Hebrew word for bricks used. Uh, one about the children of Israel making bricks for Pharaoh, and the other for the people of Babylon making bricks for the tower. And um, I think that tells you something, that Pharaoh and Nimrod, th these regimes were destructive of individuation, of individuality, of the uniqueness of people. Well, maybe just like a brick carry the thought further. You know, it's just like they're a mold, like we were saying. I was saying like cars, mm -hmm. but there's just a mold, and everybody should be the same. It's interesting. It, right. I think that, you know, this is exactly, I think, what a lot of the Midrashim are trying to tease out of the idea of bricks, that when, uh, we, when the Jewish people made the temple, they used stone. Stones are made by God, not people, and they're all very different from one another. And um, even when you cut them, I mean, you know, now we can get things pretty, you know, similar, but I imagine there's always some slight difference from stone to stone, like a cobblestones and stuff like that. There's always got to sure. be a slight difference, whereas bricks made by human beings are always the same pretty much, uh, the loss of individuation. So God made stones, and he likes diversity, and people made bricks. So on the one hand, you get the rise of technology, which the Bible seems to support that people are supposed to be um, developing technology because we're not supposed to be in nature. We're outside. God is outside the world, and he, we're supposed to emulate him to be outside the world. So we're not just supposed to operate harmoniously like the other animals within nature. We're supposed to like sort of stand above nature and look how nature operates as a system, learn how it operates, and learn how to transform it so that we can use it for our own purposes in alignment with God's intention for, for us. It's interesting. Again, it's a little bit paradoxical because on one hand, you want to be creative, but then you can't say, hey, I'm great mm -hmm. and we're everything and, you know, who needs God anymore? Sure. So on one hand, you accept God. On the other hand, you want to be creative, use your own individual. It's very hard balance. I think a lot of cultures, like I say, they rely too much on God. That's extension. What God wants, wants. On the other hand, you have more like the Western world. We're smart. We made computers. We made automobiles. Who needs God because we can, we can just make everything ourselves. But right. that balance is really the key word. And I think what's interesting about the, the point that you just shared, Rabbi Simon, is that uh, the nation of Israel is, um, you know, in terms of the, um, the layout of Asia and Europe, the old world, uh, Israel is sort of right in between. It's at the sort of the nexus or the, the center of east and west. Uh, so in that sense, it, it wants the, the individualism of the West is, is proper, and we should focus on individuals as being very, very important. I mean, the Talmud, it's well known, the Talmud says, save one man and you've saved the world. So individuals are very important. But at the same time, the collective is also important. And the, maybe the Western world has, um, you know, moved away too much from a collective orientation, sort of a toward of a hyper-individualism. And maybe the Eastern world is an imbalance of too much collectivism and not enough respect for individuals. And the nation of Israel being sort of right in between. I'm not saying that the nation of Israel 
you know, the people in the state of Israel or that the Jewish people have achieved that balance internally at present, but that as a concept that the Jewish people stuck in that territory right in between East and West could represent that. It's interesting, again, geographically. And yeah. interesting. You have a lot of good ideas over here. That, in any case, uh, where we only have a few minutes left, uh, Jordan, that um, you want to uh, maybe summarize some of the other concepts that you're working on the book, not to give away your your whole book away. Sure, from. sure. I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, you know, I think a major concern of a lot of people is um, about empire. Uh, you know, that uh, maybe uh, ISIS is going to become an empire uh, or that America is an empire and is getting overextended and therefore it's going to collapse or something like that. And um, I, I would, in my explorations, in my investigations, the research to support this book, what I found was that, um, you know, empire was almost inevitable that uh, organic conditions in the human system sort of seem to drive the development of empire, but that eventually organic conditions would, would get past empire, um, but that we could have expedited the whole process if, um, with the nation of Israel, uh, if either A, the nation of Israel had sold herself better, or B, if the nations of the world, their leaders, had been interested in paying attention. I'm not sure which, or maybe a little bit of both, but uh, the description of how empire came about is something like this, that uh, coming out of Africa, small groups made their way to the Tigris and Euphrates valleys, um, and they became agriculturalists. Other people made their way up north to the grasslands called the steppes, and they became pastoralists or herders. And something about the herding style of organizing um, created a greater military capacity, and that eventually uh, in the steppe lands there would be some kind of disturbance of rights, and that uh, this would force one group to push on the land of another, and then there would eventually be a domino effect, and the last group would then have to either die or push south, basically invade the agriculturalists. Mm -hmm. So then the agriculturalists would then create um, communities uh, that were bigger to consolidate small city-states into empires in order to fight against the, to scale up, to fight against the, uh, so you have this continual scaling up of, you know, from the agriculturalists and the pastoralists, and this is where you get the rise of empire. Uh, and the nation of Israel sort of stuck right in between the major empires of the Middle East in that early period, the Hittite Empire in the north, the Egyptians in the south, and the Assyrians in the east, sort of like this sort of anti-empire, the first nation state, as it were, which eventually, just one more second, eventually we would reach that point in global history with the rise of the European nation states, but we didn't have to take that long. Well, I think it's very, very interesting. I mean, uh, you're learning in Israel. Thank you for coming to the Jewish View. Thank you. While you're in the Kabbalah District, where you're going to have to, whenever you come back to visit the Kabbalah District, please pay us another visit and tell us all about your new book and more chapters. But it's been very, very enlightening, and we look forward to having uh, your book published. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Simon.